Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash pro revenge. In today's episode. I want someone fired for this. Comply with the 30 year old dress code? You got it, boss. Complain about me logging into my phone 30 seconds late? I'll work my hours but cost you money. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. I want someone fired for this. I'm an admin for a domiciliary care company, which mostly involves filling in forms, auditing files, and occasionally poring over documents to find compliance issues. We had recently set up a new branch in a nearby city, who were sharing some of our resources while they got going, including me and A. I arrived at work one day to find my boss, D, in her office with the manager of the new branch, J, discussing one of the new branch's employees, N. D, morning N.A., how do you fancy doing an investigatory meeting this morning? I'd minuted plenty of these meetings before, but being asked to run one was a first. Me, uh, I guess I can. What do I need to know? D, N didn't turn up for work on Friday two weeks ago and wouldn't answer his phone. J, he finally got in touch two days later, and so I gave him a rota for last Friday, which he didn't turn up to either. It's unacceptable, I want someone fired for this, it had a huge impact on our operations and caused massive trouble for our other carers and clients we could have lost our contract with the city council over this. Me, okay, what evidence do we have? J, I've got these emails about it, the rotas from both weeks and his contract. Me, okay, guess I'll have a look over them. What time's the meeting? J, 9.30. I look at my watch. It's now 9.15. Me, great, plenty of time to prepare then. I roll my eyes and leave the room while my boss sniggers. We have pretty similar senses of humor, and neither of us particularly like Jay she's caused various messes over her month or two in charge that we've had to clean up, including a time I had to travel to a different city on a day off to fix a problem she'd caused with our computer systems a pain for me because I wanted to relax that day, and a pain for the company because they had to pay me double for the overtime and double again for it being on a bank holiday, two hours of which were just getting a train there and back. At least it got me nearly a week's wages for about half a day of actual work. Anyway, some 10 minutes later I've had a scan through the emails, mostly between J and a supervisor, and it's looking like a pretty airtight case, when N walks into the office. We go into one of the private offices with another admin to take the minutes, and get ourselves started. Me, hi, I'm N.A., this is, other admin, pleasure to meet you. We're just doing an investigatory meeting today, gathering information in order to make an informed decision, etc, etc. Do you know why you've been brought in for this meeting? And, yeah, it's because I didn't turn up on, date, I'm really sorry my wife kicked me out of the house on Thursday evening. I didn't, I wasn't thinking, I was trying to find somewhere to live, so I didn't even think about calling the office until Sunday. Me, okay, it's somewhat understandable why that happened then, but the office kept trying to call you why didn't you answer your phone? And, I didn't get any calls well, not unless they were calling my house, but I didn't get any calls on my mobile phone. Yeah, that sounds like the kind of thing their branch would do. Me, okay, we'll confirm that with the branch and check if we have your mobile number as the system. Next question, why did you not turn up the next week? And, uh, what do you mean? Oh. Me, Jay gave you a rota after you called on Sunday for the next week, shows him the rota, which you never showed up for. And, no she didn't. She told me not to go to work until I'd come in for a meeting with her about Friday. This meeting. Oh shit. She can't have seriously forgotten to tell me that, can she? Me, okay, do you have anything we can use to prove that? And, yeah, she sent me it in an email, let me get it up on my phone. I finished the meeting up pretty quickly after that, also finding out that in 30 years in the care business he'd not once had a disciplinary, and was terrified he was going to be fired. I calmed him down and told him that he wasn't going to be fired today and I couldn't say for sure about whether he would in the disciplinary, but if he's telling the truth he almost certainly won't be. I went back to my desk to continue the investigation when both D and J came over. J, so how did the investigation go? What did he say? As I turned to face J, I looked at D. She knows, if I look at her before answering someone, that she needs to play along, and I'll fill her in later. I spread a rueful smile across my face. 
Me, I'm sorry Jay, but I can't discuss ongoing investigations you know, company policy and all that. Quality and compliance director would have my head if he found out. This was a total lie, but if I tell people something is company policy, they almost always believe me I'm the only person sad enough to have read all eight lever arch files of our company policies and procedures instead of just looking them up when I need them. Anyway, the lie was enough to drive her off to do some actual work, maybe in another office, so I could do my investigating. I called a director I was friendly with and convinced them to make sure ends leave while the investigation was ongoing would be paid, so he could try to sort himself out a bit without worrying about money too. I called our finance department and asked them to request a log of calls made from the new office that Friday from our telecom supplier. I logged into our carer tracking software to look at what emails had been sent, when calls had been assigned, and what data they had on end. I also read the emails I'd been given in more detail. A week later I sat down with JN and two of the directors, D1 and D2, who had gotten involved that second day and had missed had ended up costing the branch a package worth nearly £4,000 a week, which at the time was about one-third of the money it was making, and meant they'd started losing money, so the board of directors wanted it resolved there and then. I started with the basic facts and had missed the first Friday due to problems at home, gotten in contact Sunday, but claimed no one had gotten in contact with him, and that he had been told not to come in the following Friday. Jay snorted at this. Her face fell when I revealed what my investigation had uncovered though. The call log showed eight calls had been made to his home phone, but none to his mobile. The reason for this was that N's mobile number wasn't in the system. As the branch didn't have a full-time admin yet, acquiring and entering this data was Jay's responsibility. N's rota for that week hadn't been emailed by anyone in the company, and the calls had been assigned to him on Wednesday of that week by Jay. Best of all, the emails Jay had handed to me contained one confirming he would not be working until an investigation had been completed or more accurately, it said don't come in until we arrange a meeting. Jay, well, I suppose I made some small mistakes, but in dash. D1, small? Small mistakes? You lost a £4,000 package because you couldn't do your job properly. Jay, I it were a small branch just getting started, there's bound to be a couple of hitches dash. D2, a couple? With this, D2 pulled a thick ring binder out of his bag and dropped it on the table. I really enjoyed listening to that thud. D2, these are complaints we've received from your staff and other managers about you. We need to have a long talk. I helped them set up a call with our legal consultants before N and I left. I told N that the initial Friday meant he was still going to have a disciplinary meeting, but I'd put in a word to make sure it was as lenient as possible I think he ended up with a verbal warning. When I walked into D's office she was grinning like a Cheshire cat. D, pretty sure everyone in the office heard D one there. Me, can I assume you're responsible for the big old file of complaints? D, well, one or two, but I did get the ball rolling. She did say she wanted someone fired, after all. I met the new manager for their branch about a week later. He managed to get them back in the black pretty quickly, and hasn't bothered me outside of a few issues getting emails on his laptop, so he's alright in my book. Comply with the 30-year-old dress code? You got it, boss. The shelter I've, 30M, been working it for a couple of years now is over 30 years old, and is quite notorious for keeping things that way. The daily notes are physically kept in binders, 80s-style punitive measures are imposed on clients in conflict, and the electrical panels are labeled with cards that went through a typewriter. You get the idea. The floor supervisor, over 20 years in that position, emphasized that even though jeans were allowed, we needed to strictly adhere to the dress code. That meant button-up or collared shirts, no logos, only long pants slash dresses, no hats unless you're outside, no visible tattoos, etc. In other words, dress nothing like the vast majority of the people we serve. We're meant to dress the way they should aspire to dress, said the supervisor. I was told other staff including staff above my pay grade have long hated the dress code and unsuccessfully tried to change it for years. None of them were bold little shits like me though. Given my previous experience with underserved populations, I also knew this was a terrible idea. Generally speaking what people in these communities lack in financial resources, they make up for in their abilities to read people and navigate emotions. If they think you're an authority figure or acting inauthentic, many will outright write you off. And for the most part they have a great social slash emotional radar. The dress code said men's shirts must. 
have visible buttons or a collar. I sewed two buttons near my hip on a plain t-shirt and wore it in. They said nothing the first time, but had a meeting where they weren't pointing out anyone in particular and updated that specific part of the policy to prevent me from doing it again. Next I wore capris. After all, nothing about pant length was mentioned either. That time the code was updated, and we were informed via email. Still no one-on-one -on -one conversation about it. A few months and minor malicious compliances later, our workplace gave us logoed t-shirts with the institution's name and website on them. Hooray, we thought. We will at least be able to wear t-shirts now. Nope. After a week of several co-workers wearing the shirts they gave us, we got an org-wide email that the shirts did not comply with the dress code and should not be worn during work hours. Knowing me as the office rabble-rouser, several pissed-off co-workers came to me independently to ask how they too could rebel. Enter the story's biggest malicious compliance. As a minimalist, I had no desire to hold onto a shirt that I would not wear. We had no input on the design slash color of the shirts, and I simply did not need it taking up space in my closet. The most reasonable alternative would be to turn the shirt back in and explain that, so I did. Coworker number one was moving soon and didn't need an extra thing to pack, so she also turned hers in. Hashtag 2's partner hated dark green, the shirt's color, so he turned his in. This happened all they way to 25 total employees, with some borrowing others' excuses. After five days, the supervisor had a box with two dozen shirts sitting in his tiny office. He actually has to keep them on his desk, and I can hear him bumping his hand against them when he uses the mouse. Three months later they are still there. He's not dumb, he knows those shirts are an F.U. that lives in his office. He cannot donate them to the shelter due to some other ridiculous handbook rule about organizational spending, and he bikes six miles to work so driving them home isn't a reasonable option. He's tried putting them in general office storage, but his boss has said the shirts are the supervisor's problem since he ordered them. Currently he's just stuck. We know it bothers him, but he knows he can't bring it up since it's his own rules that prevent us from wearing them. No dress code changes so far, but the top of the year meeting regarding our handbook has dress code on the table. Three of the people who return shirts are a part of that advisory board of five. I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll finally be rid of, of some of the dumb, short-sighted elements of our dress code come February. Complain about me logging into my phone 30 seconds late? I'll work my hours but cost you money. My first job out of bar school was with an ambulance chasing firm. I worked 12 to 8 p.m. in the call center calling people after accidents to get them to sign with us for a personal injury claim. Officially this was not cold calling as the details were passed to us by insurance companies who assured us that each lead had confirmed injuries and asked to speak to a lawyer. I have my doubts over how truthful the insurers were after a number of people I called denied any injury, or seemed surprised to be contacted by a solicitor's firm, but that is not the cause of the story. I was very good at my job. Our target was for 10 new claims a day, so if you got a car with driver and passenger in the front and three kids in the back you were laughing as that one call was half your quota. Many colleagues would go on to a go slow once they had their 10, but I kept busy if nothing else it was boring there when not working in time dragged and would average about 25 new clients a day. After 6 months we get a new manager in the call center. I've of those micromanager types which is a style I do not respond well to. I start getting emails saying things like you were 30 seconds slash 1 minute and 23 seconds late logging into the system today. Make sure you stay late by that much time. Now I should point out that up until now I logged out at the end of my shift bang on time unless I was on a call in which case I would finish it, and if this was a call with 5 people and you could be stuck for another 45 minutes. We also had to turn the computers off at the end of the day, easy hit shut down and walk off, and turn them on at the start of our shift. The computers being slow this could take 5 minutes before you could log into the call system. I responded to the first few emails pointing out that logging into the call system 30 seconds late meant I had actually turned the computer on, which was technically part of my job, about four and a half minutes before my shift started, and I stayed late regularly to finish calls. The manager told me that the time to turn on the computer was not part of my job, and it had to be ready to make calls bang on 12. I contacted HR, and they reluctantly agreed that turning on the computer was one of our duties and therefore we only needed to be in ready to press the power button at 12. New manager was not easily been though. He started buying the time we got to our desks and then, as is always the case when relying on public transport, 
If you were a few seconds or minutes late he'd send the email telling you to work the extra time at the end of your shift. I decided that I had had enough of this, and so I decided to work to rule. I stopped trying to get new clients after hitting my 10 for the day, and would play on the internet unless getting an incoming call from someone responding to a voicemail. I wouldn't make any outgoing calls after hitting the daily target. I also decided that if I was on a call at 8 pm I would simply tell the potential client my shift has now finished, hang up and turn the computer off. I did this for a week and encouraged others to do it. When the weekly stats hit my boss desk he realized we were about a third down in terms of clients secured compared to other weeks. He called us into a meeting with his head of department and bull locked us all, asking why we were all lazy and not securing clients. Screaming about us hanging up on clients. I just said you told us you wanted us to work as required by the contract, down to the second that's all we're doing. Do you not like it? A few weeks later he was gone and a much more sensible manager moved in. Things went back to the way they were. I ended up staying at the firm for 7 years, although only in the call center for 9 months before moving on to case handling, and then trial work. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share, and we will see you in the next video.